Hey there YouTube, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and on today's Web DM, we're going to be discussing lasting consequences, real problems for your characters to overcome. How do you do it, how do you keep doing it, and how do you get over it? Let's get to it. Jim. Yep. We play D&D &D a lot, right? Not as much as I'd like to, uh, but I, yes, I agree. We, do, we do play uh, a, a lot of D&D. So, other than death, what are the consequences that await a player character? Like, what are the lasting consequences? I mean, they've gotten rid of a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is sort of a consequence of, of there being a very uh, vocal group of players who are opposed to things like negative levels, ability score damage that's permanent, yeah. um, curses that really debilitate your character. Some of the more nastier things that are in uh, older editions of Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. the edges have been softened or they've been removed altogether. I mean, think of like Undead in say original basic or, or, or first edition D&D, they are terrifying monsters because a lot of the undead drain levels. Yes. And those are they hard, hard won, hard fought levels that can go away in, 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 uh, in an instant. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, uh, you know, that's a, a cleric, having a cleric in the party in those editions is a good way to sort of prevent that. Uh, over the editions and over the years, a lot of those negative consequences, the, the conditions, the debilitating effects or, or detrimental uh, conditions that could impact your character have been lessened. Yeah. And it's more difficult to die, uh, the way that death saves work, the fact that there's not a negative hit point balance you have to pay off in order to bring someone back from zero. It, it just makes those kinds of things difficult. And then you throw that, throw in the fact that in fifth edition, the cleric class specifically but really anyone with access to lesser restoration, greater restoration, curing magic, revivify, things like that, cuts out a lot of the negative consequences you could, uh, you could have for your character in fifth edition. And this is frustrating to some DMs. They want their player characters to either feel like they're in genuine danger yeah. and act accordingly, or they want to have the consequences of a negative condition or, or a detrimental effect play out in game and not be immediately uh, negated by re using restoration magic. Right, because you know you get to a certain level and you get cursed with something, and then you just go to the next town over and they cast remove curse. Right, assuming there's there's other casters, or they just have a cleric in the party. There's sort of two things going on. Either you have it in the party and it's trivially overcome because they've got the spell slots available to to uh, cast that magic, mm -hmm. or you've somehow made that kind of magic available for your campaign because early on you wanted readily ready healing magic to to be to be available so that the players could keep going or whatever it is this sort of frustration that i've seen come about and and, and some people have asked us about stems from kind of two things a, a a desire to the frustration with the cleric as a class of specifically singling out the cleric and not the bard or the druid or, or sometimes or even the paladin mm -hmm. really that can perform similar roles so i mean in this case cleric is the stand-in for or any character class that can use restoration type. But that's what they do. And if you're playing a cleric, particularly something like a life cleric, you're there to bring the party, get them back on their feet and ready for the next battle, yeah. ready for whatever comes after. You should let that player do that. That's why they're there. <laughs> that's why they made the character. Yeah. And, and also an understanding that there's more to having lasting consequences for the player characters than bodily harm. Because otherwise you're just looking at all the PCs as bags of hit points. And thinking about what the next fight and, and how that's going to overcome. Now, I, I want to take seriously this complaint though and, and say like, yes, it, for some DMs it is a real problem. Yeah. They want to have lasting consequences for the party members but they're having a tough time making those consequences stick because of restoration type magic. There are a variety of answers that you can uh, use to address this problem. If you've created a campaign, and, and this is a joint effort from DM and players, yeah. the responsibility for it doesn't fall on either side of the DM screen. It's everybody's responsibility to create a campaign where they have connections and relationships with NPCs and each other, and things that they care about and are concerned with mm -hmm. outside of just their ability to keep going and to keep fighting and to keep casting spells and things like mm -hmm. that. And so you wanna foster those conditions in your game, foster yeah. relationships between player characters and non-player characters, between elements in your campaign so that they're 
there are things that you can threaten. Not too much, because eventually players are going to get tired of having the things they care about constantly be threatened. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they will grow weary of it eventually. <laughs> Do you think that's why the kind of the cliched uh, character backstory is... is like the know, orphan. The orphan. No, no the family. family right. already got killed, uh -huh. so now I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, one no one can touch me. No connections. Because it comes from DMs taking any connection that the, that the player has created for their character and exploiting it relentlessly to the point where the player's just like, well, now it's a liability. And instead, what you want to do is have those connections that the party members have, either with each other or with an NPC, and threaten them just enough. Put them in danger or peril just enough so that it kind of brings out those emotions of like, oh man, what are we going to do? I really care about this thing. I don't want this bad condition to happen. But not so much that the party is just like, I just, I'm tired, I don't care, I don't, you know, I'm on my own, I don't want to have to worry about any of this. It's a fine balance to have to strike. Yeah, but that takes some player buy-in also. Right, it does take player buy-in and a player willingness to deliberately make themselves vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, and their character is vulnerable to these things. If a DM's frustrated, it's like, oh, I just can't get that disease to stick, that curse, the poison condition is too easily overcome, death never happens because of, of revivification magic and, and things like that, then consider having a, a more robust campaign with these different kind of connections between your players. There are other things that you can threaten other than bodily harm. But let's say you do want that disease to stick. Okay. You do want that curse to stick. Okay. You do want the, them to face sort of negative consequences for their character. So how do, how do you do that? I mean, on the one hand, you can just start changing the conditions of these spells, right? Uh, you can take a look at the type of restoration magic that's, uh, that, that means that these uh, detrimental effects are very easily overcome. And you can look at those spells and go, well, can I impose maybe some more expensive material components? that make those spells more difficult to cast, yeah. right? Uh, this is one of the things that we talked about in our Raised Dead Resurrection show, is that the, the cost of the diamond, even for Revivify, should be a big deal. It should be something that the party can never really overcome unless you're specifically looking for a lot of bringing characters back from the dead. Yeah. Right, so if you, do, if you are in a situation where the party has multiple diamonds worth hundreds and hundreds of gold pieces, they didn't create those themselves. You gave them those. And so it's the same way with like, say, uh, lesser restoration or greater restoration or healing magic or, or dispel evil or remove curse or whatever. You can like change the characteristics of those spells so that it's more difficult to cast them yeah. or a hurdle to cast them because they have to require some sort of special material component. Or even just flat out changing the level of the spell uh, is one. Yeah. A good example of this is cur bestow curse and remove curse, right? Right, right. So if, if I'm understanding uh, correctly, we've got bestow curse, which can be cast from third through ninth level. Mm -hmm. And really all that does is change the duration of the effect, right? Yeah, it's like a minute and like a, like something like 10 minutes or an hour. Something like that. Yeah. Eight hours, 24 hours, mm -hmm. until dispelled. Until, up until, the, it, it like lasts that. until dispelled. Right. And so in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, I, I kind of see that it should, for bestow curse specifically, maybe it influences more than just the uh, duration. And in order to get really powerful effects, you have to use a higher level spell slot, except you can spend a ninth level spell slot on a bestow curse that's then negated by a third level remove curse, right? Yeah. That's one of those things where I see an imbalance and I go, you know, I kind of might make the players have to use a comparable spell slot or at the very least treat it like a dispel magic. In which case, you can use a third level dispel on a ninth level effect, but you've got to roll a caster check, right? You've got to make that, it, it, it's yeah. not guaranteed. Yeah. And so I might do something similar with Bestow Curse. I might do something similar with Lesser Restoration or even Greater Restoration, in which case, you know, depending on where the detrimental effect came from, uh, the nature of it, it might not be just a matter of spending the spell slot and casting the spell. There might be a skill roll involved. Mm. There might need, it might need to be that the, uh, that the party needs to go to a specific location to, yeah, yeah. for this magic to work to its full effect or for them to acquire certain items that, uh, that they use. Let's say, for instance, in order to get a, uh, a remove curse, they've got to go find a, a saintly relic that they will then use as a spell focus to cast this spell. Yeah. Or they have to visit the, uh, the sacred glade in the enchanted forest to awaken the slumbering prince. Uh, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, go and beseech some some thing to help you remove this. You know, right. like a unicorn in the same glade. I mean, or, exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and making making the removal of these conditions part of a larger 
challenge or story yeah. that you then play out and yeah. not something that at the end of the fight it's just like well I cast that spell let's move on it's like it never happened yeah have it be that you have to live with this condition for a little bit and turn the removal of it into a challenge uh, itself and out of that will grow sort of a, a narrative or story for it right well a good example of that is in your blue medusa Maze of the Blue Medusa game. Right. My my warlock Poe. We recently took on a, a, a plant lich or, a, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> it was a lich. It was a very elaborate backstory. It's basically a lich that can uh, that is a wellspring of life. Uh, yeah. Because the flow of negative energy is reversed uh, out of them. Right. So yeah. just plants were just popping up everywhere, but uh -huh. he kept hitting us with these innervation. Uh, attacks yeah and I dropped a zero from one of them right and so when I came back when I was brought back mm -hmm. my left hand it was just sort of withered was and, withered because right. I, I I think I tried to block it with something I forgot what I tried to do but mm -hmm. or no he touched that's where he touched me uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and so my hand was just withered and yeah. so I I forgot what the exact I like had disadvantage to do anything with my hands uh -huh, and uh -huh. I could only really grip like my really, spell really focus, hand, yeah. yeah, my arcane focus in one hand, and the other hand I really can't do anything with. Yeah. And I'm gonna have to figure out how to get that removed. Right, and so again, in this case, we set it up with like a, a healers in a specific part of the world are able to restore life to withered limbs. Yeah. And so it now involves a quest, it involves getting to the place, finding the healer that you need to find, and then they will undoubtedly want something from you in return. Yeah. And the getting there and the finding them and, and the getting them to work with you is then part of a larger adventure. And it's not just a random cleric that comes along and casts like you know a restoration spell on you. It, it's part of the adventure now. Yeah. And it's something that your character has to live with for a little bit. It's not necessarily permanent, it sticks with them for a while. I really liked, in other editions of the game, those detrimental effects. I liked the danger that was presented by having negative levels. Yeah. And, and the fact that there are monsters and creatures in there that inflict conditions that's not just death that they can do. They can really mess up your character. They can change your characteristics. You can maybe yeah. drain you of strength or constitution. They can wither your intelligence. They can drain you of levels. Mm -hmm. and, and having those kinds of effects in there added teeth to the game and added um, a, a, an element of danger to it that to me enhanced the enjoyment of the game. Right. And surviving those encounters unscathed was like a real accomplishment. It was like, man, that was really great. We fought that ghost and no one was aged. I'm vaguely remembering, I think it was Cory's monk. We, we were fighting a bunch of wraiths or ghosts. I can't remember what it was exactly. Mm -hmm. But when he got out of that fight, I think he had like four negative levels or something. Right. And we basically had to keep him alive to the end of the fight because now he's only like second level. Yeah. And so we're just kind of trying to protect him and we finally got out of it, got him restored, makes it more harrowing. You it know? makes it more harrowing. And, and, and I, you know, it, advice to players in these situations is like, if nothing negative ever happens to your characters, if they survive every fight unscathed, if they get through every challenge and they're always the victor, I'm, I just, I don't see how that wouldn't eventually get boring. Even for like new players where right. this is still exciting right. and new and they don't really know what's going on. Like eventually you're gonna want some sort of setback or some sort of challenge or difficulty or something to overcome in order for it to be an interesting game, right? Right, where's the arc? At that yeah, point, I mean, that's really it. I, I, I'm, I'm not one to say that you plan all this stuff out and that narrative arcs and, and story and everything are something that you should necessarily bake into your game, but yeah. they can emerge from play. Yeah. And, and you can look back on the life of a character or a campaign and go, yes, this was my arc. This is what happened. I, this thing happened and here was how I reacted. And that reaction led to this thing and then this other other event or something came in. And then you can look back over a character that's been played over a year or two years or however long and say like, wow, that's this is a, a, a rich, full story. And when I tell it in hindsight, it has the elements of a, sort of an arc and development and growth. I know there are some people who think you can sort of plan that from the beginning. I am not one of those people, but I, I do think you can retroactively look and in the retelling of a campaign, have some kind of arc mm -hmm. or, or character development and having negative consequences is a vital part of that. Having things your character has to overcome, struggles yeah. that they have to, to deal with. What if everything your character accomplished, there was never a setback? Ever. Right, ever. And, and that's just, to me, not a very interesting way to play the game. And having some kinds of setbacks is okay. Yeah. You grow and, and, and live and your character does other things yeah. and adapts from it. I mean, even Luke lost a hand. It might have been temporary, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it comes back, but then you can still introduce, you know, if you're, if you're Luke's character and I'm the DM for Luke, 
then you have a mechanical hand. It's going to occasionally not work. There yeah. might be environments where that the delicate mechanics of your replacement just yeah. aren't going to aren't going to happen, you know, aren't going to work or it's you know, requires regular maintenance or or something. And those are the kinds of things that um that I think make for a richer and fuller game. Yeah. And you can have um hurdles you can make overcoming the detrimental effects part of the game itself instead of just one thing that happens I, I cast the spell and then it's done yeah and instead um have it last for a while either temporarily that you have to live with or or permanently mm -hmm. in the case of say psychological or physical effects of coming back from the dead um it, you know it, this well, is this is where flaws are such a good thing right exactly like, well, I mean, bring well, and also just bringing back something like mad, like some kind of madness. I mean, you know, going through that, shouldn't that, shouldn't there be some a lingering effect, a PTSD, something? Let's say your character's been cursed, and they, the enemy spellcaster nails them with a curse. They have to live with it for a while. Now, I know bestow curse. There's really limited in in in, in what the options in the player's handbook are. But I'm kind of one of those people where it's like bestow curse. If a player comes to me and they've got an interesting or elaborate or weird kind of curse, then, yeah. then it should be fine. I, I, my benchmark is that a fifth level bestow curse should bestow lyc lycanthropy, right? That's sort of my benchmark uh, for it because in second edition, uh, create lycanthrope was a fifth level spell. Yeah. And that's just in my mind, I'm like, okay, fifth level bestow curse, you can start permanently affecting people with these kinds of conditions. So like uh, like Kelimvor. Right, like that's, Kelimvor. That's a perfect example of a yeah. great lycanthropic curse yes yeah and, and sort of skipping a generation i know that the specific of the spell fifth level is probably like 24 hours or something like that yeah um but that's where i would change the rules in favor of it being more interesting or, or something like that and so what if after they've gotten that curse removed the characters lived with this curse for a while they've dealt with a couple of cycles of the moon and the ramifications of it maybe they don't even know Right. This is one of those. This is one of the areas where I will roll in secret and not, and I will not roll this one in open. Right. And I, I might not even let the character know that something had happened to them till the first full moon, and they have dreams of blood, and they wake up <laughs> naked somewhere else, covered in blood. And the rest of the party has been looking. And the for rest them. of the party has been looking for them, following the trail of bodies that they've left in their wake. And now it's a problem. What do we do? How do we get this fixed? And if you, and if the party cleric can just go remove curse then you've taken a lot of the oomph out of that scenario. Yeah. And if instead the party has to seek out uh, the dryad of the wood and they have to beseech the dryad and say, hey, we've got this guy that's cursed, uh, et cetera. And then it's like, okay, well, in order to remove that curse, you're gonna need these three items mm -hmm. and you're gonna have to come back to me. And, and once you get those three items, you're also gonna have to do, you owe me a favor. Yeah. And then that favor is, you know. Yeah, he's got a horny satyr friend that needs to get laid. <laughs> right. So. I gotta start making some hard you gotta, decisions. You gotta hook up, you know uh, hook up the, the, yeah. hook up the uh, satyr buddy of the yeah. dryad. This is where celestials and fey which are very often not presented in opposition to the party, that you don't often get to use those creatures you know, as opponents to the party, but you can still interject them. Everyone knows that the hermit at the top of the mountain will bring back the dead for a price, and you have to guard the body of the dead while this ritual is performed. But what no one knows is that that's a deva or a planetar or something in disguise uh, you know, doing penance for a crime they committed in Mount Celestia, they have been forced into mortal form and are, are forced to serve humanity and, and the good races of the world for a mm -hmm. thousand years before they're gonna be let back in. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing you can do, particularly if you don't want the, that kind of restoration magic on demand yeah. uh, from the players. You wanna make it a bit more of a challenge or in, inject kind of uh, story elements into it. Have monsters be the ones that uh, provide that restoration type magic and now the party has to negotiate with them. Now the party has to seek them out. They have yeah. to find information about them. They have to perform a quest. They have to do something. And then and there is a ritual involved that the party has to get in, get uh, participate in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then only after all of that has happened do you remove the detrimental effect. And right. I, I find this a balance of best of both worlds. Yeah. You get the removal of the effect, but you also have to, it's also kind of a pain in the ass to deal with. <laughs> you have to jump through some hurdles uh, to get it. Sometimes you just need to make them jump through a few hoops. Sometimes you do, and it's the jumping of the hoops that creates a story that's interesting and creates the emotional resonance, resonance that a lot of people seem to crave out of Dungeons and & Dragons. And that honestly is one of the best parts about D&D. Yeah. Is the fact that you do grow attached to these characters and you do grow attached to the campaign. And yeah. You want to see it continue. You want to see it continue and it hurts sometimes when they get hurt, but you know, 
that is the curse of role players, isn't it? Right. You know, the emotional attachment uh, to your characters, and then when they suffer a humiliating defeat or worse, uh, you just have to live with it and uh, deal. I am in favor of lasting consequences in, in some capacity. Not overdoing it. Yeah. Not uh, beating the players over the head with it or making them so scared to do anything because they don't want to lose or have control of their characters taken away or something. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, every single person in the world has a, a limb missing. Right. Like they're all citizens <laughs> in Starship Troopers or something. Like right. Everyone's got legs missing or an arm <laughs> missing and it's just like man this right. place is fucked up. Yeah something horrible has yeah. happened. There's a ton of stuff like diseases. I mean think about our, our own world for a minute and in the medieval past of our world in, in the middle ages and early modern era disease is a huge problem right yeah. it's going to wipe out communities depending on what kind of disease it is. It's going to wipe out armies you know and, and until like the 19th century and sanitization and immunization and germ theory and everything. For most of human history disease is a horrific thing. Yet, the fact that it's so easy to overcome for party members, if they have access to this restoration magic, means that it's an avenue of, of conflict, mm -hmm. of challenge that's cut off from the DM. And so making it less accessible, making making curing those things a little less accessible, is going to add a richness to your game. And, uh, and, and I think you'll be better off for it, even if it sucks if it happens to your character. Thinking about that, like like the, the, the steps we made in treating diseases, it's amazing that like one of the largest steps was just one guy going like, wait a minute, what if we washed our hands <laughs> when we got done with one guy with, before we started working on another right, guy? He's talking about the one where it's like, what, what, if, what if we did that? What if when we were rooting around dead bodies, we washed our hands before we went and delivered babies? <laughs> What do you think? What do you think? Uh, Bob, uh, I don't know. I, don't know I, I, I just don't know about that. That's not the way God intended it. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Let's consider something uh, something horrible. Something that's like uh, on the scale of the Black Death for, yeah. for your campaign. And this is like an overall campaign thing. There is a, a horrific plague that's ripping through the villages and cities of your world. Um, and you want the characters to be, to be cautious. Yeah. Not so afraid that they don't act. But you right. want them to be like, okay, I, I can't just uh, I can't just charge in. I need to, we need to think clearly about this. How are we going to assist the kingdom in overcoming this plague? What are we going to do with this village that's like half the people have died in or something? Because this is D and D, there are other things you need to worry about. You've got a bunch of dead bodies lying around. That's not usually a good thing. Yeah, in Dungeons you know, and Dragons. The disease gonna, called undeath could spring up at any moment. Right. That's going to attract <laughs> ghouls and other monsters that eat the dead, um, and it's going to be great fodder for a necromancer or something. But you want the players to feel like that disease could strike them at any minute. And yet you don't want to have a, the cleric or the paladin or the druid or whoever go, ah, no, I got this one. And second off, having these detrimental effects that are very easily overcome mm -hmm. also cheapens those character classes who don't have to worry about those things, right? You yeah. kind of play a paladin because you want to be able to fight werewolves without becoming a werewolf yourself. Yeah. You know, you play a monk because eventually you want to have sufficient mastery over your character's body that they can shut out those things and they don't have to worry about them. And so if you have easily overcome diseases, poisons, conditions, curses, things like that, I think it's okay to tell your players like, yeah, uh, I, I'm altering the way restoration type magic works. I'm altering the way raised dead magic works, which Check out our show on Raise Dead Magic for suggestions on how to do that. And, and, and changing the way it works because I want to create a game where it's just a little bit more difficult to overcome these things. And that's going to require a change on the player's behavior. The, yeah. the baseline rules are meant for, for these things to be easily overcome. We're going to get rid of them. They're temporary conditions that you have to deal with in the heat of the moment. Once the crisis has subsided, once combat's over, yeah. spell slot, spell slot, spell slot, we're done. Yeah. Short rest, everybody gets their hit die back. Now we're on to the next fight. Next fight, please. Right. And now. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you're running a really combat-heavy game, I can see how it would be difficult to have lasting consequences that way, but you, you might want to consider making changes and discussing them with your players and saying, like, hey, I really want you guys to be a bit more cautious. Think of the role-playing opportunity of dealing with these things. Say, like, listen, this could be a, an opportunity for you to explore different parts of your character, to have different things happen to them, for them to grow in unexpected and new ways. Um, one of the things that, that always bothers me a lot with, with players is those that have an idea of what they want to do with their character in the future. I don't so much mind if they've got a lot of backstory or things like that. Um, that's entirely up to them. But the ones who are like, I want X, Y, Z to happen for my character in the future. Yeah. It's like, well, then why are you playing this game and not yeah. just 
why don't you just write some fanfic about your character? That's perfectly legit. There are plenty of places out there where you can do that and enjoy and have a, a great time in that hobby. Part of the reason you play the game is the uncertainty. Yeah. Things like that. Why do you go adventuring? Because it's there. Can and if it was you? handed to you on a silver platter, then then that's not really, it's not interesting to me. I think it can, some, sometimes it's fun. Yeah. But it doesn't make necessarily for an interesting or engaging game. And I think having more negative consequences and, and, and having them last, uh, maybe not permanently, but for several adventures, uh, is, a, is, um, is a way to kind of have that and, and develop you know, interesting stories for your game. Well, I find that interesting as well. well there you go. What are the lasting consequences of D&D? &D? No, there's not that many. Anymore. Wake up, Kim. You ready? You're doing great. Yeah, let's go. Three more. That's it. Eyes on the prize. All right. All right. Oh. Action.